Hi, I'm Dr. Ted Rosen, Professor of Dermatology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Republic of Texas. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about new anti-infective agents or techniques. This is my conflict of interest. For the last two years, these relationships have all ended. The big theme is resistance. Bugs, and by that I mean the generic word bugs, bacteria, fungi, viruses, parasites, they all develop resistance. And that's why we need new anti-infectives. There, I've answered that question right off the bat. We're gonna take them sort of subject by subject. So antibiotic resistance, look at these, these headlines from Newsweek and Time. Revenge of the killer microbes, death of antibiotics. A little dramatic, but you know, it's a problem. Worldwide now, now, we have 700,000 deaths a year due to antibiotic resistant bacteria. And it's estimated that by the year 2050, we'll have 10 million, 10 million deaths per year, unless we develop new drugs or techniques. That's according to the World Health Organization. You know, I don't care if they're off by a million or two, that's a lot of deaths. By the year 2050, according to the World Health Organization, one person will die every three seconds due to antibiotic resistance, unless we do better. So we contribute to the overuse of antibiotics. Dermatologists and other dermatology practitioners comprise about one percentish of all US healthcare providers, but we prescribe over 5% of all the antibiotics. Things have gotten better and worse. So this is a nice retrospective claims data analysis. There's actually two of them. They're sister articles that were published in 2019. I don't think things have changed much since then. We've done a bit better. We've gone from 3.36 antibiotic prescriptions per 100 visits down to 2.13 antibiotics per 100 visits. So that's good. That's from 2008 to 2016. Maybe overall we're prescribing less. Maybe we're being a little more selective in who we give antibiotics to, because that's how you develop resistance, right? But the second paper, post-surgical use of antibiotics has actually risen during that same time period from 2.73 to 3.92 per 100 surgical visits. That's a 40% increase. And of course, that exposes patients to antibiotics where they can develop resistance and or have adverse events from the antibiotics. Let's take just a little closer look. So this is where you see it in conjunction with the use of flaps, grafts, and with Mohs surgery. And most of this is prophylactic use of antibiotics, not treating infection. We know the infection rate from cutaneous surgery is very low. Generally, every study shows it's under 2%. So this is prophylactic antibiotic use. Use antibiotics wisely. Know what you're treating. Don't use antibiotics just in case they might be or might get infected. Always proper dose and duration always have an exit strategy. If you start antibiotics, there should be a time and a place where you know you're going to stop them. And advise your patients on proper antibiotic use. Don't save some, don't share them with family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, the like. And the message is clear when we're talking about surgery, use restraint in prescribing antibiotics. Prophylactic antibiotics, there are very specific times and places to use them, not on everybody who gets any kind of procedure. What do we have? Ozonoxacin is a new antibiotic. These are all not 2022 drugs, but when I've talked about them, people seem to be not aware 
So I'm going to talk about a few things that are even a few years old. This is a non-fluorinated quinolone, 1% cream, indicated for impetigo. It's used twice a day for five days, superior to placebo, non-inferior to an already existing topical agent, latapamula, for impetigo. And you can see microbiologic effect in as little as two days. I'm particularly fond of this. This is the pivotal study and a recap of some studies. And me. So this is for impetigo ozonoxacin, twice daily for five days. Now I know what you're thinking. Do we need another agent? The answer is yes. We've had mupiracin for a goodly long time. This is a relatively recent study trying to estimate the prevalence of mupiracin resistance. And globally, both for MRSA and MSSA, and remember, staph now causes most impetigo, not strep. Used to be strep, now it's staph. The prevalence is about 8%, but in some places it's much higher. For example, there was a study done in New York City Every borough was a little different, but in upper Manhattan and the Bronx, it was 40 plus percent resistance of staff to mupiracin. That number is even higher in Harris County, where I am. So the message here is we needed another agent for impetigo. We got one. And you need to know what your impetigo causing bacteria are and are not sensitive to in your locale. I'm sure you're all probably familiar with serocycline. I just had to include it for completeness sake. It's a new tetracycline classed antibiotic with a very narrow spectrum. So it treats cutie bacterium acnes. That's why it's used for acne. It treats staph aureus, but doesn't do a darn thing to gram-negative bacteria, so you don't, by giving it for acne, 12 weeks, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, you don't develop enteric bacteria that are resistant, who can then pass that resistance on to other bacteria. Very low risk of things like yeast infection. So good drug for acne, serocycline. Comes as 60, 100, 150 milligrams. It's not approved for, but there's at least one study that suggests in the same dosing regimen, a milligram and a half per kilogram per day for 12 weeks, that it would be helpful for rosacea as well. Not approved. Omatocycline is an antibiotic most people in dermatology are not familiar with. It's an amino methyl cycling. So it's basic chemical structure is a tetracycline, but it has that amino methyl group right at the end of it. And that's important because it confers a lack of resistance. It allows that antibiotic to evade efflux pumps and to avoid ribosomal protection proteins. Omatocycline is available IV and oral. It's once daily dosing after a loading to give it orally comes as 150 milligrams, you give three of those, 450 milligrams a day for two days, and then it's two of those 300 milligrams a day thereafter. And it was approved for acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections uh, in 2018. Found to be not inferior to linazolid. The one bad thing about this is it's very costly. You have to go through specialty pharmacies. It can't be dispensed in you know, Walgreens or CVS, except CVS specialty pharmacy. And you have to get approval there. So insurance will cover it because it's really outrageously expensive. One thing it's good for is erysipelas. Another thing is wound infections. And the third thing is deep abscesses. Another interesting property is it's good against the organisms in the oral flora of dogs and cats. So infected dog and cat bites, not human bites, because it doesn't do anything against Iconella, which is a gram negative, but it does against uh, Pastorella multacida, for example. So infected dog and cat bites 
you can use this in lieu of IV antibiotics and a hospital stay. These are really, really bad cat bites. You have to start treatment within hopefully the first eight to maximum 12 hours. Otherwise, they'll probably, the deep penetrating bites of the hand will probably end up in the hospital. STDs are resurgent. This was a year ago when we had the 2019 statistics. This is the 2020 statistics. Uh, basically, year over year over year, there's more and more and more STD. How much more? Here's 2018. 2019, gonorrhea, syphilis, all stages, and congenital syphilis. Let's go to 2020, even more gonorrhea, more all cases, all stages of syphilis and congenital syphilis. Gonorrhea, we don't treat the thick discharge, but you might see this, what's called bullhead clap, might or might not have discharge, might or might have dysuria, just swelling at the distal shaft. Or you need to recognize gonococcemia, a small number of these gunmetal gray vesicle pustules, usually a rounded joint on the foot, the ankle, the elbow, the wrist. And the treatment for uncomplicated gonorrhea has changed based on current recommendations to single dose ceftriaxone 500 milligrams, not 250. Unfortunately, there now is resistance. Remember, that's the theme. Confirmed in at least 12 countries, there have been some resistant cases in Hawaii and California. Eventually, we'll have resistance everywhere. And so we have some new drugs, solithromycin, gepatitocin, and zoliflodicin, which compare relatively favorably to ceftriaxone. We won't see probably solithromycin because of liver toxicity and GI intolerance, but we will see the other two. And by the way, we may also see gepatitocin because it's now being studied for bacterial skin and skin structure infections, not just gonorrhea. HIV in the US, the darker the blue the state, the higher the rate of HIV per 100,000 population. We have simplified therapy. I love every other month an IM injection of cabotegravir and ropivirine every other month, approved in February of this year. That's it for the treatment of HIV. Much better and easier than it used to be. And for prophylaxis, prevention of HIV in the first place, approved the end of 2021, so a few months ago, but still relatively new, is an extended release suspension of cabotegravir given IM, two injections one month apart, then every two months, again, six injections a year. These are for people who are at high risk of acquiring HIV. They get this injection that reduces their risk of acquiring HIV infection. Does anything work for molluscum? Well, according to this Cochrane Library, a review, nothing really has been proven effective, but you know, no one's going to hear that. So two things to suggest. One is hyperthermia. This is a small Chinese study. They used an infrared device that we don't have, but you can do the same thing with a heating pad. And if you think about it, heating pad is nice because it's generally flexible and often covered by a soft cloth. As long as the heating pad gets up to 44 degrees centigrade, 111 degrees Fahrenheit, you apply it to where the molluscum are for 30 minutes, once a week. This study ended at 12 weeks, but there's no reason you couldn't go further. And both children and adults cleared their molluscum, a little over half. I've used this frequently in adults with molluscum on and around the genitalia, and it's been superb, and nothing could be more natural than heat, no chemicals. And we will have eventually 
a new proprietary 0.7% cantharidine supplied in a precision applicator, that little narrow point, with a visualizing agent. It's purple, so that you know which molluscum you've already treated. You just put a drop on each molluscum. You do that every three weeks. Complete cure, about 50%, but lesion clearance, almost 70% to over 80%. And then if you wanted to do something physical to the few remaining lesions, it's much more humane cryotherapy, curatage, et cetera. This is coming. It's already been submitted for approval. It was declined based on a manufacturing plant issue, which I'm sure will be solved in the relatively near future. How about mosquitoes? What, you're talking about anti-infectives and you're talking about mosquitoes? Sure, high-tech mosquitoes for diseases that are spread by mosquitoes. So this company, Oxitec, which is a spin-off from Oxford University in Great Britain, they've developed mosquitoes that contain a self-destruction gene, it's actually a set of genes. They put them in male mosquitoes. Male mosquitoes don't bite, they drink nectar. But those male mosquitoes with this destructo derby gene set mates with wild females, all the new females die. The only ones that live are more males that still have the self-destruction gene. And ultimately there's so much of this that goes on, you don't have any mosquitoes biting to transmit diseases like Zika, chikungunya, dengue, and West Nile. There was an outbreak last summer of dengue and the Florida Keys. So this is a real real issue still. In fact, the EPA and the Florida Department of Health have already approved the release of millions of these genetically modified mosquitoes on a weekly basis if dengue appears again. Head lice, not just a pediatric disease, because of selfies. People are putting their heads together. Silly people like me, that's risking getting head lice from other people who put their heads next to yours. There was a study done a few years ago. There's a small follow-up, which indicates the changes have not disappeared, where everything but two states, Alaska and West Virginia, collected head lice, and they were looked at for the presence of resistance genes to pyrethroids. Those are the commonly used, often over-the-counter agents, like RID. A200. And you see 42 out of 48 states, 100% of all the head lice collected carried the resistance genes against pyrethroids. And the other ones had 50 plus percent of the head lice with resistance genes. So the pyrethroids are losing it. This is not an acceptable treatment for head lice. So there is a drug, it's called abimetapir, which was approved in the United States in July of 2020. That's a couple of years ago now. It blocks metalloproteinases. It does something totally different than the pyrethroids. So the eggs don't open, and it also interferes with enzymes, metalloproteinase enzymes in adults. It's ovicidal, therefore, and pediculocidal, a single. 10-minute application in phase three U.S. studies led to nearly 90% complete cure two years ago. Where is it? There's a problem. The people who invented it, a company out of Australia, licensed it for distribution in the U.S. to Dr. Reddy's. Apparently, there's some kind of legal dispute over royalties and what have you. I don't know the details, but now FDA says marketing status by Dr. Reddy's who owns the license to it in the US, marketing status has been discontinued and the patent's gonna run out on it. So we may not see this, I'm sorry to say, but there is good news on the head lice. Ivermectin lotion used to be prescription, is OTC, 
since late in 2020, but now it's readily available in a local pharmacy. There's virtually no resistance yet. It's approved all the way down to six months of age. Commercial price is about 340 bucks. But if your patients go online, they can find a coupon that lowers that to about 35. So we do have something else to do for all these resistant head lice. Scabies, OMG, two studies from Germany showing ivermectin and permethrin resistance and a study from Italy showing permethrin resistance. They used a lot of permethrin. Two consecutive days overnight, five days later, two more consecutive days, and 96 out of 155 people so treated resisted it. So there's permethrin resistance in spades. So there is something new, just approved for scabies. It's spinosad. If that sounds familiar, it should, because that's natroba. It's the same drug we've had for 11 years for the treatment of head lice, except now it's approved for scabies. A single overnight application is all you need. And this is readily available. It is prescription, but it's readily available. And they're the results of the study notice. It's very well tolerated. And if you want to actually read the 2022 study on spinosad for scabies, not head lice, there's the reference. Fungi. Oh, we vastly underestimate the resistance of fungi. Vastly. This is a study from. India, where only 28% of their trichophyton species isolates were sensitive to terbinafine. There was just another study published from Denmark where you can't get drugs over the counter. I mean, it's really antibiotic, antifungal, antiviral. It's really difficult for the public to misuse anti-infectives. And it was the same thing. We have increasing resistance to our workforce drug, terbinafine for dermatified infections. So what's on the horizon? We've got a bunch of drugs. I don't have time to talk about all of them. I'm just gonna mention a few. ME1111 is a pyrazole that interferes with succinate dehydrogenase. That's a new mechanism of action and it's being developed as a topical for onychomycosis. Phosmanagepix is a unique, it's its only thing in its chemical category. It blocks inositol acyl transferase, which prevents the mannoproteins from attaching to the beta-1,3 glucans in the cell wall. And it looks like it's going to be very effective for a whole bunch of things. We have MAT2203. That's basically oral amphotericin B. They found a way to make it so it can resist acid in the stomach. And the first thing it'll probably be approved for is mucocutaneous candidiasis. That's what it's being studied for. But then I see it being approved for a lot of other things. And abrexafungorp is a brand new chemical class, triterpenoids. It inhibits the formation of those beta 1, 3D glucans in the cell wall. It's approved, and it was just approved about a year ago, but it wasn't available until now. And it's supplied as a 150 milligram tablet, comes as a box with four tablets. You take two of them, 12 hours later, you take two more. And what it's approved for is acute vulvovaginal candidiasis, including fluconazole resistant vulvovaginal candida. There's the ME1111. It's in its own little class here, the pyrazoles, and it blocks one portion of succinate dehydrogenase, again, being developed for onychomycosis. This is the one I'm most excited about, VT1161, otessiconazole. I'll talk about it in just a second. And then T2307, which is an aryl amidine, a brand new chemical class, interferes with mitochondrial fungal process. That's brand new mechanism of action. And it's quite good for malassezia. So we might see it for 
Actinia versicolor. So atasaconazole was approved just a couple months ago. It's a tetrazole. So it's got four nitrogens in that five-membered ring. It inhibits lanosterol dimethylase, but it's very specific. So some azoles, as you know, have lots of drug-drug interactions like itraconazole does. This has almost none because it's very, very specific for fungal cytochromes. It was tested against placebo and fluconazole for chronic vulvovaginal candidiasis. If brexifungor was for acute, this is for people who are having 9, 10, 11, 12, or more repeat episodes of candida vulvovaginitis. And it's approved for that. It is contraindicated in women of childbearing potential or pregnancy without adequate protection against pregnancy. It's approved with and without fluconazole. I think the without fluconazole is kind of weird because people generally have already taken fluconazole and it didn't work. So I just want to concentrate on the otasiconazole only. It comes as a package of 18. It's 150 milligrams. You take 600 milligrams, that's four, day one. Then you take 450 milligrams, that's three on day two, that's week one. Then on day 14, that's week two. And once weekly thereafter, you take one 150 milligrams. So it's a 12 week treatment. They did this and they followed people for a year. Remember, all these people were having multiple, multiple recurrences of vulvovaginal candidiasis. About 2% or so have headache and nausea. It can elevate CPK, but that's pretty uncommon. Take it with food to alleviate the nausea. But here's how good it did. Those who had confirmed recurrences, 4% and 6.7% in the two pivotal trials. Pretty darn good. That means 94 to 96% of people who are having multiple, multiple recurrences of vulva vaginal candidiasis after this 12 week course over the course of a year never had another recurrence. But what I'm really excited about is this drug's also been studied for onychomycosis. Again, in short courses, 14 day loading phase, and then once a week for 10 or 22 weeks, they followed them again to a year, 48 weeks, 32 to 42% had total complete cure of onychomycosis. That beats terbinafine. And it's a lot easier to do, short course. So this is finishing up now phase three, and we should see otasiconazole. Vivjoa is the brand name for Candida. I don't know if they'll keep the same name or they'll use a different name for onychomycosis, but we should see this for onychomycosis in the not too distant future. Last but not least, in the antifungal realm, we have Novexatin NP213. It's a synthetic antimicrobial peptide in aqueous solution being tested for onychomycosis. So we'll have some new topical drugs for onychomycosis, hopefully as good at or even better than what we have now. Off the wall things, except they're not off the wall anymore. This is Ticoviramat. It's the first drug with an indication for smallpox, but it also works for monkeypox. So we stopped administering smallpox vaccine in 1972, stopped, uh, we, we thought it was eradicated worldwide in 1980, but there is still smallpox virus available in biologic warfare research labs. If it's weaponized, a high mortality rate would be anticipated. Do we need to worry? I made this slide set up before that war in the Ukraine. And the answer is, there are people who might do this. So now we have a drug. It's administered by weight, 200, 400, or 600 milligrams twice daily for 14 days, depending on your weight, 25, 40, or over 40 kilograms. And this should treat smallpox, and we know it also treats 
monkeypox. It's in very short supply. It's in the stockpile, but in short supply, a lot of doses have been ordered. So we'll have a lot of it available. Chagas disease not routinely seen in this country, or is it? It's seen in Central South America, Mexico, spread by the bite of the regivied bug or cone-nosed or assassin bug. Megacolon, megaesophagus, and cardiomegaly are the ultimate result. It's a trypanosome. It gets in the muscle, destroys the muscle. So the colon enlarges, the esophagus enlarges, and the heart enlarges, and they're not functional anymore. Should we worry? Well, somebody collected a lot of these conodes or assassin regivides in the US and found that over half of them actually harbored T. cruzii, especially in Texas, Louisiana, Florida, New Mexico, and Arizona. And it turns out there have been a couple of studies where Americans with cardiomegaly and unknown etiology, somebody actually tested their blood and it turns out they had a positive serology for Chagas disease. So maybe these bugs are transmitting this disease, which we don't think about because it's not considered an endemic American disease, but maybe it is. And you know what? Guess what? We have a drug for it. It's called benznitazole, approved a few years ago. It's a drug with a lot of toxicity. We won't be administering it, but keep in mind it does exist. And then for the truly obscure new anti-infectives, we have a drug for onchocerciasis, river blindness, and a new drug, fexinidazole, for the treatment of African sleeping sickness, African trypanosomiasis. Prevention, we'll talk about very briefly. You all know there's a new shingles vaccine. It's a good drug, much better than the old shingles vaccine. We know at least for nine years there are sufficient antibodies to make this effective, a high efficacy at reduction the post-herpetic neuralgia near 90%. The only downside of the new shingles vaccine is that a little under 17% of people will get some adverse event. That can include redness, swelling, and pain at the injection site, which lasts two to three days, or they can have systemic symptoms, including headache or fever or fatigue or GI upset. That lasts for one or two days but it's a great vaccine, should be recommended for everybody who's eligible. It is approved down to age 50. Just for completeness sake, there actually is a vaccine approved in the US against Ebola. You vaccinate everyone around the incident case so that they don't develop it. Vaccine doesn't work for someone who's already Ebola affected, but, there is therapy approved in 2020. There are two different ones. They're monoclonal antibodies directed against the Ebola virus, and they reduce the risk of death considerably. And using that mRNA technology that we've used to develop COVID-19 vaccines, that's now being used for vaccines against things like Zika virus. And in preliminary data, looks like dynamite. So if we see a resurgence of Zika virus spread by the 80s mosquitoes, like we did, Brazil, Puerto Rico, there were cases in Florida, Texas, we'll have probably a vaccine against Zika. And there are also vaccine being developed against chikungunya. Last thing I wanna mention is HIV, this was a very promising study. That vaccine study has been discontinued, did not work. There are two ongoing vaccine studies. My bet is they're not gonna work either, but using that same mRNA technology, Moderna has developed not one, not two, but three HIV vaccines containing based upon proteins that are in the spike of HIV virus. So we might actually have an effective HIV vaccine 
in the not too distant future. First shot was given February of this year. So hopefully we're on the way for an HIV vaccine. So I've given you a lot of information on new anti-infectives, everything from mosquitoes to heat, to vaccines, to new drugs. And I hope you'll learn to love and use some of these interventions in the future. Thank you.